Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, evolutionary niching in the Gator genetic algorithm that we wrote for molecular crystal structure prediction. Um, so what is molecular crystal structure prediction? Well, uh, starting from a uh, 2D stick diagram of a molecule, predict what are the putative crystal structures of that molecule when, when it forms a solid. Uh, here we studied uh, target 13, which came from the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center's blind test. Um, so molecular crystals are used for uh, many applications, such as uh, organic electronics, pharmaceuticals, pigments, dyes, explosives, uh, you name it. So uh, one familiar example is an aspirin, aspirin crystal. Um, so right here we see the... Uh, uh, a plot of the free energy stability versus density of various crystallographic configurations that are the points. And the red shapes indicate uh, putative crystal structures. So um, we notice for um, the graph on the right that that is for a molecular crystal. For the graph on the left, that is an ionic crystal. And we see that for the molecular crystal, there are uh, many structures that are very close in energy. Uh, this is because uh, they're bound together with weak Vanderwaals interactions, um, as opposed to ionic crystals where there really is just kind of one global minimum. Uh, so the ability of, of a molecular crystal to have, um, to uh, solidify in various states is called polymorphism, and that definitely increases the challenge uh, with uh, molecular crystal structure prediction. This in combination with like uh, the uh, long computation times necessitate enhanced searching algorithm. To this end, we developed Gator, a genetic algorithm specifically tailored uh, for molecular crystal structures. I won't go into the details of what are genetic algorithms here, um, except to say that, like Darwinian evolution, uh, the fittest structures uh, will pass on their genes. Um, so the standard way to define fitness uh, is just with energy alone. Um, these energies are computed uh, with uh, light settings of uh, DFT with the van der Waals correction, FHA Ames code. Um, so the fitness here is just the uh, normalized and relative um, energy values uh, with respect to the current max and min energies of the population. At, uh, so I is like structure I. Um, so what problems may arise uh, with just an energy-based fitness function? Well, for one thing, uh, crystal structures pack in various motifs, and we'd like to be able to use this to aid the search. So some motifs include a uh, layered, zigzag, herringbone, flat lattice, um, to name a few. So another thing is that the potential energy surface is typically um, has a lot of local minima. And uh, you know we're not sure which local minima may have viable polymorphs. So um, uh, if we just go based on energy, then we may be susceptible to a phenomenon called genetic drift, which is that uh, basically it's the same as, um, as as just being stuck in a local minimum. And uh, so we need to like balance exploration versus exploitation. This is true of any like global optimization search. Um, so one way to do that that we have developed is to introduce a cluster-based fitness function. Um, it could be as simple as uh, dividing by an attribute of clusters um, of, of structures. For instance, uh, it could be the number of structures in the cluster, um, in structure I's cluster, or uh, it could be a distance from the center of that cluster. So you know, there are a few um, clustering algorithms we could use. We use unsupervised machine learning, uh, in specific, we have affinity propagation and k-means. These are just toy examples of what they are. Um, the, the key difference is that with k-means, you have to choose the number of clusters beforehand, leading to some like outstretching, um, like it's forcing those points to be in its cluster. Versus affinity propagation is able to autonomously determine which structures belong to which cluster. So uh, here we see an example of uh, how k-means and infinity propagation uh, cluster the same set of 410 crystal structures. This is the lattice parameter space, ABC. 
Uh, so yeah, so each point represents a crystal structure. And uh, we see a similar effect of in the k-means kind of outreaching to uh, faraway points versus affinity propagation typically does better with this. Affinity propagation does require a descriptor and a distance metric, which is true of many machine learning applications. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna describe a few of them that we used. One is a lattice parameter descriptor. We have uh, the, it's based on the cell, essentially. You have the lattice parameters, A, B, C, and uh, um, they form a feature vector um, when you divide by the cube root of the volume. Uh, the, last the, lattice, the lattice we use is nuclear reduced and standardized because there are many representations of the same structure, if you're familiar with, with uh, space group and stuff. Now, uh, another one is um, radial distribution function. Uh, this one, uh, the, the equation there basically says like, um, describes how the density of atoms of type Y vary as a function of distance from atoms of type X. Um, and uh, so N sub X is just the number, um, the number of atoms of type X in your extended cell. And I sub J go over atoms of type X and Y. B is just some uh, smoothing constant on the radial distribution function. Um, so if you, if you apply a, a vector of, of, um, of radii to use, then you can get a feature vector, um, uh, which is our radial distribution function vector, say for bromine-bromine, and then you could uh, do it for other combinations of interatomic contacts and get a concatenated feature vector, which is uh, uh, more generally suitable. Uh, you might use something like this if particular interatomic contacts, such as hydrogen bonds or halogen bonds, uh, are influential in like determining stability. Um, the last descriptor we used is uh, one we developed called relative coordinate descriptor. Um, here, um, starting at the bottom, uh, if you define molecular axes to place on 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 your molecules. Um, and imagine those axes placed on all of the molecules in the extended cell up there. Um, now the, the, the molecule at the base of that, uh, that vector is, is a reference molecule and all the rest are uh, neighboring, um, neighboring molecules. So you can compute the, the, the uh, position vector of the center of mass uh, from the reference to each of the neighbors. And that's the R com of K. And then you can, uh, Take the dot product of, of that with the, with the axes of the reference molecule. You can also take the, uh, and, and that's P, and then you can take the dot product of the axes of the reference molecule with, with each of the neighbor's axes, and you get then uh, Q. So you can see P um, is a measure of similarity or difference uh, <clears throat> with regard to position of the molecules, and uh, Q is a measure of like the orientation difference. So uh, if you concatenate them together, you get R, which is uh, the RCD vector. And then if you want to compute a distance between two structures, one and two, um, which are the subscripts there, uh, you can compute a distance matrix D. Um, and so to do that, you just subtract, you, you take the normalized, uh, normalized by the, the bottom factors there. Uh, so the normalized um, L2 norm squared of each of those P's and Q's. So, and then C it's like scales the relative importance of the difference in position with the difference in orientation. So, uh, um, you then uh, sum up the, uh, the M smallest entries of D to get the like, what is the number, what is the distance between these two structures. Um, there is some, some arbitrariness to this, but again, th there's some arbitrariness to any distance definition. Um, so I want to do a quick run through of how we generated the structures um, in the first place. Um, we use a package we wrote called Generis, um, which starts off using uh, some physical constraints such as a volume range and a lattice parameter range and then uses space group symmetry operations to generate uh, the crystal structures um, for at least a, 
you know, at least a, a, a random but physically viable subset. Um, we might generate 5,000 structures with this. Then we use the Harris approximation, which is HA, to get a, an estimate of the energies of each of those 5,000 structures. We use the Harris approximation because it's a fast approximation. Um, briefly, what it is is uh, you take the self-consistent density of one molecule, you basically copy-paste it or superimpose it uh, to all the other molecules in the cell, and then you take the, um, you just get the energy assuming non-interacting fragments, fragment densities. Then um, uh, we use uh, the RCD feature vector and affinity propagation to come up with uh, what are the clusters, and then sample uh, for a total of 10% of the total pool. So if we had 5,000, then we, we come up with 500 structures that are the, low, they are the lowest 500 energies, but they're also uniformly sampled throughout the clusters um, in, an attempt, in an attempt to promote diversity. Then, um, then we do uh, affinity propagation again on those remaining 500 structures and select uh, the cluster centers as the 50 structures as our uh, final initial pool. We will relax them using self-consistent DFT to, uh, to get our final pool. Now, uh, so using those descriptors, um, we uh, ran Gator with, with them. Here we see um, the average relative energy of the structures uh, over GA iteration. So an iteration is when you add a new structure to the pool. Um, the R is for like uh, a random initial pool and the D is for a diverse. So random is just the diverse um, workflow I mentioned, except, uh, well, it's just that first part, just, just generating physically viable structures. But you don't do the clustering, et cetera. So that's the random pool. Um, and then we have control runs as well, which don't utilize cluster-based fitness or, or affinity propagation at all. So um, we see that on average the clustering runs had higher average energies over time. Uh, this would be expected for a higher degree of exploration versus exploitation. Um, but we do get some boons from this because uh, they are more likely to find the global minimum structure, whereas the, um, the control runs, red and brown, uh, typically plateau and do not uh, get out of that local minimum. So one way to visualize the, like, the structures is in lattice parameter space. Um, so these are, uh, these are plots of uh, you know, various... Uh, Various runs where the left column is for the random initial pool, right is for the diverse initial pool. <clears throat> so we want to see how, how did the GA perform, uh, not just based on energy, but how did it perform in the, uh, the like search of the space. Well, we see that uh, the control runs without cluster-based fitness, they exploited too much. And there's very dense region, very dense region at the bottom there. Um, versus the region that actually contained the, uh, the uh, global minimum denoted by green X, uh, was not searched very, very effectively by the control runs. Whereas they are somewhat effectively searched by the, the niching runs. Um, so radial distribution function and uh, relative coordinate descriptor performed similarly to each other, uh, but the lattice Parameter descriptor also was able to search uh, a flat lattice motif uh, denoted by by the uh, the small uh, the small a parameter. One way to visualize the resultant clusters because we we thought long and hard about you know how do you visualize clusters that are so high dimensional right, and uh, one way we thought is to use paired histograms. So the uh, these show the the counts in each cluster as determined by affinity propagation at the end of the genetic algorithm run. Uh, that's in blue. The red is affinity propagation's prediction, um, has a predict method, uh, prediction of the cluster, uh, of the, yeah, of the clusters of uh, the control run. So that we can like tell how did the control run do on these clusters uh, as compared to the niching runs. 
The orange lines and dots represent the, the mean and standard deviation of the energies of, of those clusters, and the green arrow is where the global minimum was found. So um, we see that uh, evolutionary niching like suppressed the over and under sampling of certain regions. For instance, um, you can see in the, it's hard to point, but uh, in the, the top there, it really oversampled that region, the, the, the control run did. And, and similarly toward the bottom of the middle graph. Um, versus it really undersampled other regions like the bottom of the left one and the top of the middle one. Um, as opposed to the blue, uh, the blue bins, which, which tend to be more uniform. And because of this uniformity, they're able to, they're able to find the, uh, they're able to find the, the, the global minimum. Um, you might also notice the gray histograms. Those are the uh, initial pool structures where they ended up, which clusters they ended up in. And um, um, we can tell that uh, the, that the, um, that the control runs had a harder time breaking out of the initial pool biases versus the niching runs were able to break out. So um, <clears throat> on, on average, RCD has higher energy standard deviations. This is, uh, this is possibly due to uh, its weaker correlation with cell volume and uh, elongated cells with, uh, with zigzag and herringbone motifs are more likely uh, to be correlated with um, layered cells, but Latval's few clusters indicate not capturing more subtler motifs. So basically, basically there's a trade-off between like capturing capturing really subtle motifs and um, really being able to uh, like like what is a motif, right? You know, um, it's hard to know how many clusters um, really determine. Are, are, are really an accurate number of motifs there. So molecular crystal structure prediction has to do with finding all the potential polymorphs, not just the global minimum. Uh, so we looked at the we looked at the ability of the uh, of the various runs to determine the, the top ten structures in terms of energy. Uh, so here we see a table. Hopefully we can read it of uh, the rank in energy uh, for various. Uh, uh, where delta E is the relative energy. Um, there are various combinations of uh, volume, lattice parameter, um, Z, just number of molecules per cell, uh, the space group, and the runs that actually generated that structure. So from this, we can tell that uh, the global minimum had a zigzag motif and uh, it was only found with niching. The number six and eight have a herringbone motif and were only generated with niching. Seven out of 10 of these were found by at least one of the control runs, but most have layered packing motif. And nine of 10 were found by at least one of the niching runs. So because of this, uh, evolutionary niching can be a viable tool in, in generating novel structures that may be overlooked otherwise. <clears throat> so uh, in conclusion, the polymorphic energy landscape has many local minima close in energy, some of which may be viable polymorphs. A balance between exploration and exploitation is needed to combat genetic drift. This is achieved by niching, which is clustering based on certain descriptors and distance metrics, along with a cluster-based fitness. Niching takes advantage of the tendency of molecules to pack in various motifs, and niching enabled discovery of the global minimum and other motifs that were harder to find for standard, standard energy-based fitness. And finally, evolutionary machining can be used as a viable tool for uh, generating novel structures that may be overlooked otherwise. Thank you. When you see Alvaro, say hello. I used to <laughs> yeah. work with a guy back at Oak Ridge. Yeah. Um, question, this is, this is the, I guess, the coup, the coup de gras question is, is the predicted global minimum you see the actual one you see in experiment? Um, for target 13, it, it is. It is. So that is thermodynamically that, 
Because I, I'm, I'm always always concerned about the difference between thermo versus kinetically trapped polymorphs. Yeah. But in this case, it is. But you're saying if it's kinetically trapped polymorph, there's no way we're going to get to it. So, um, so for other uh, for other molecules, uh, we notice that the like what is ranked as the lowest energy polymorph may not be necessarily the experimental one, probably for that reason. Um, however, it, it is usually uh, in the top ten or so. Um, and it is because of the entropic contribution that you get some re-ranking. Um, we don't uh, we don't run the uh, phononic uh, you know calculations um, simply because the uh, the computational cost of of uh, calculating the energies and relaxing the structures as we go through GA iterations is is already quite high. So. Um, it's something we could do, and but it's uh, and probably something we would do at the very end in a blind test. But uh, it's it's uh, it's computationally just more intensive uh, if you already add it onto DFT. Um, so it seems like your 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 main takeaway is is relating to the clustering, right? You're creating these niches. Um, is there a reason you chose the algorithms you did? Because some of the the um, some of the features you're looking at, like the RDF, can be pretty noisy, right? So you might be interested in using an algorithm like dbscan or something as opposed to affinity propagation that's a little bit more um, sensitive or will not be as sensitive to those. So, um, so um, you, need, you need some sort of generality uh, with, your, with your features because um, like, like it might be noisy, but at the same time, um, you know, you need to keep it in, in, in terms that that could apply to like any um, you know any new search. Uh, so developing tailored searches uh, to like every molecule that you want to search is not necessarily like doesn't make for the best search algorithm, right? Right. So yeah. Maybe I wasn't as clear. I just meant um, in terms of the choice of clustering algorithm that you did. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, if you have something like an RDF, which can have you know, lots of small features, and those are not necessarily distinguishing very much relative to the global features. Uh, you know, different clustering algorithms might just do better. I was just curious if you looked into that. Um, so besides, uh, yeah, besides k-means and affinity propagation, we haven't, like, uh, we actually did look at SketchMap as well um, as another clustering algorithm, but um, um, we have, which I believe SketchMap uses dbscan, uh, so, um, when we when we did try to cluster it, it, it looked, it, it did not. I don't know. The clusters did not look good. Uh, so, um, like, we don't know how they produced it in their paper, but um, yeah. So basically, yeah, we, we we did look at that, but. Yeah. Have you tried to apply your method to the uh, blind test? Yeah. Uh, yep. Um, did it work? So, so um, we um, we had not actually. Uh, so we didn't find uh, the like the true global minimum on the blind test, and the reason was because our uh, our our uh, our angle like the the alpha beta gamma lattice, lattice parameter angles were not. Uh, we set a certain range to those, which we thought was reasonable, but I think the actual like angle was something like twenty or thirty degrees. So it was, we didn't uh, we didn't go that low. And have you tried to apply uh, your method to the previous blind tests? Like there are six blind tests just checked online, uh, just to to teach your algorithm probably or <clears throat> to pick a better op option. Yeah. So I mean, uh, so we did apply it to that blind test. However, um, since then, like we've we've used those structures as like benchmark, like like in this case, um, trying to predict those, so that we can hopefully be prepared for the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just a quick question about uh, termination. So. How did you decide when you were finished? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. With genetic algorithms and any stochastic global optimization, there there is no uh, 
deterministic endpoint. And so you have to, you have to, you know, you, ha you have to, uh, you have to choose a certain, uh, like a way to stop. We use, um, for instance, uh, if the global minimum energy has not changed in a certain number of iterations, then, then you may stop. Uh, or you could just set like a certain uh, cap in the number of structures uh, to generate and say, we're gonna generate this many and then, and then, uh, and then stop it there. Um, <clears throat> uh, based on you know, just many runs that we've done, we can get a heuristic for how many that should be and that is uh, around 300 or so. Uh, you know, up, up to 400, which was done in, which was done here. So to give people time to get down to the lightning talks, I think it's time to wrap. Let's thank our speaker, and I'd like to thank all the speakers.